sigma will be small. As the particle becomes larger, these strains here become bigger. Yeah, you can see that the distortion here is very large. Eventually, they become so large that you can't tolerate the distortion and you introduce defects known as dislocations. So this is now an incoherent particle and the interface energy is large because there's a lot more defects here than here. So when we go from a small particle to a large particle, the interface energy increases. Now think about the opposite process, where we are going from a large particle to a small particle. We gain coherency. Okay? So in the mechanical alloying process, where you create mixtures of very small particles, you start with incoherent interfaces, and then you force them to become coherent, and eventually, when this becomes small enough, you completely lose interface energy, because it becomes a solution. You don't have an interface around each atom. So, we have to allow the interface energy to decrease as the particle size becomes smaller. And when you do that, everything falls into place. Yeah? So, so, I'll show you a really interesting prediction, which has never been verified. So, this experiment needs to be done. Yeah? Uh, as you go to smaller and smaller particle size, the free energy doesn't decrease continuously. It actually increases first and then decreases. Why is that? Because here we are creating more in incoherent interfaces. And then coherency starts to come in. So this is exactly the opposite of the nucleation barrier that we normally have. When a small particle has to become larger before the free energy starts decreasing. This is exactly the opposite of the nucleation barrier. We are starting with a large particle and going to a smaller particle. Now, of course, to do this experimentally is very difficult, but not impossible. But nobody has done to discover whether this is correct or not. If we have a mixture of atoms where the A atoms like to be next to A atoms rather than next to B atoms, then we predict that there are two barriers. Because you introduce a second barrier when you start to force A atoms to be next to B atoms, even if they don't want to be. Yeah? Because mechanical alloying doesn't allow diffusion. Yeah? It means that you're forcing atoms to be next to neighbors that they don't like. And therefore, you have to do some extra work. A much, much more interesting result is that this is conventional theory, but this is the entropy of mixing. And the shape of the free energy curve is like this. And it reaches infinite slope here and here. Because if I differentiate this equation, and I set x equal to 0 or 1, I get negative or positive infinite slope. So at pure A and B, the textbook will tell you that the slope of this curve should be infinite here and here. But that's a mistake. Yeah? All the textbooks will tell you this, but it's a mistake. And it's a mistake because we are treating concentration as a continuous variable. That means concentration can be any value. But what our model shows is that it can't be any value. You can only change concentration by one atom at a time. Right? It's not a continuous variable. So actually, the slope will not be infinite. If this is the minimum change in concentration, then the slope will be finite. So just by looking at the theory for forming a solution starting with large particles going to small, there's really a fundamental change in the way we think about the thermodynamics of solution. These curves are not curves. They are actually a whole series of dots with nothing in between because concentration is not a continuous variable. Now, of course, this doesn't change the world as we know it, but it's very interesting you know, that even though thermodynamics has been around for a very, very long time, you can still improve on it. Okay? Okay.
getting back to this point about uh, making large quantities of cheap nanocrystalline metals. Let's see how far we can go. Okay. So, yes, of course, we can produce very fine grade structures. Unfortunately, this, uh, this is off the scale, but this is 0.4 micrometers, and we produce very fine grains with a lot of misorientation between the grains. In other words, a very, very strong material. And this is after the powder has been consolidated by extrusion. So we can produce large lumps of this material. But, you know, the question that we had from Professor Young over there about cipher, why is it ductile? Yeah? I explained that cipher is ductile because it's a very small damage. This is a very strong material. Absolutely no ductility. Okay? So we certainly we have produced a very strong material by mechanical alloying with a very fine grain structure. But because we made the size large, there's no ductility, no toughness. You can't possibly use this material in an engineering application. So so far I have only given you disappointments. Yeah? We showed that severe deformation, you can produce wires, you can produce thin sheets, but not large material, a large dimension. If we try to produce strength by making perfect crystals, then that's no good, because as soon as we increase the size of that, the strength collapses. Supposing that we produce severely deformed material and we try to join it all up by extrusion to produce a large sample, then the toughness or ductility vanishes. So, my question was, can we produce large objects by severely deforming and consolidating? And of course we can produce large objects. It's a very, very expensive process, first of all, to produce uh, uh, this mechanically alloyed powder. And secondly, we don't have the toughness that we need. So let's rule this process out as well and see what we can do. Do you have any questions about that section? Or about mechanical alloying as a way of producing very, very fine structures? single barrier, this is happening because at first I have incoherent interfaces and as, as I make my particle size smaller, the amount of surface is increasing. So the free energy actually increases as we make the particle size smaller until you start to gain coherency and the interface energy decreases. And this is a case where the A atoms like to be next to the B atoms. In other words, mixing is favored. The enthalpy change is negative. When I break an AA bond and a BB bond, bond to form an AB bond, there is a reduction in energy. Okay. If I now consider the opposite case, where the A atoms prefer to be next to their own kind, okay. that means A atoms want to be next to A atoms and B atoms prefer to be next to B atoms. So if you look over here, there is a negative sign. If you look over here, there's a positive sign. So when I break an AA bond, a BB bond, to create AB bond, there's an increase in free energy. Then, as I try to force A and B atoms to mix, the free energy rises again because of this term here. So that's why we have a double barrier to solution formation when light atoms prefer to be next to their own kind. A atoms prefer to be next to their own kind. That's why we have a double barrier. This is related to interface energy, and this is related to the enthalpy change of mixing. 
Okay, let me proceed on to some good news now. Okay. So I'm going to rule out mechanical alloying as a method for producing large quantities of cheap nanocrystalline metals. Okay, let's now look at the possibility of producing large quantities of cheap nanocrystalline metals by phase transformation to generate fine, very fine structures. Now, of course, the steel industry has been working on this for many, many decades. The finer the grain size, the better. And the big breakthrough happened in 1960s when microalloy steels came about so that you could control the austenite grain size and therefore produce a finer ferrite grain size. And recently there are big projects in Japan, China, Korea uh, on producing you know, one micrometer or less than one micrometer ferrite grain size by deformation. So let me summarize that first. Uh, and in order to talk about phase transformations, I need to explain to you the mechanism by which a phase transformation happens, because there are different kinds of phase transformations. Okay, so imagine that we have a parent phase, which has this crystal structure, this is the unit cell, here, yeah? and there are two kinds of atoms, the square atom and the round atom. Yeah? There can be anything, two kinds of atoms iron, manganese, or whatever. Now, one way of changing the crystal structure is to physically deform this pattern, this rectangle, into a different shape. So this is a different crystal structure, which are produced by deformation of the parent phase, a homogeneous deformation. So this is called displacive transformation. For example, martensitic transformation, where there's no diffusion but you change the arrangement of atoms by deforming the lattice. Everybody happy with that? Now, of course, if there's no diffusion, then the chemical composition of this is exactly the same as the chemical composition here. And notice that this atom has these two neighbors, which are exactly the same in the parent phase. So this has a memory of the atomic arrangement in the parent phase. So if I reverse the transformation, then I recover exactly the same parent phase. And this is why we have shape memory methods. Yeah? That you transform, you change the overall shape because the pattern in which the atoms are arranged changes. When I reverse the transformation, the overall shape also reverses. That's how shape memory method works. But the important point is there is no diffusion and there is a change in shape. So there's a very large strain if I do this transformation inside a bulk material. You can imagine that if we are pushing against other crystals and we have this change in shape, there will be a lot of strain energy. So it's not an equilibrium transformation mechanism, but it happens whenever diffusion is too slow, in other words, at low temperatures. Now, the second way in which we can get a phase transformation is if I take all the bonds and I break them and I rearrange the atoms into the new pattern without changing the external shape. Okay. So here the external shape is not changed. For example, when water freezes to ice, we don't see a change in the shape of the container. Okay. Although we've had a change in crystal structure. So we've achieved the change in crystal structure without changing the overall shape, and you can think of that as follows. First, we do a displacement transmission. We cut this triangle off, and we put it onto this side, so that we recover the shape. And that cutting off and putting on this side is diffusion. It's transport of mass. Yeah, it's diffusion. And of course, if diffusion happens, then we will also get a redistribution of atoms. So you can see that here, we have all the square atoms now in the parent phase, because they prefer in the product phase, because we, they prefer to be in the pro product phase. If we are having diffusion, that the atoms can redistribute into the lowest energy configuration, and in this case, there's a higher solubility for the square atoms, 
in the product phase than in the parent phase. And we've lost all the memory. Yeah. The atoms here are not in the same arrangement as the atoms in the parent phase. And therefore we don't have any shape memory effect with what we call a reconstructive or a diffusional transformation. This can only happen at high temperatures where there is enough atomic mobility, enough diffusion. So first of all, I'm going to talk about this kind of transformation to see how fine a grain size we can get. Because that is how the vast majority of the 1.1 billion tons of steel that we manufacture every year is produced by diffusional transformations, ferrite, perlite. Remember that when we reduce the size of crystal, we have to produce free energy because there is a surface energy per unit area and the amount of surface per unit volume, if I multiply by that, I get the total amount of defect energy that I store in my material by making a small grain. I've got to provide that energy to the material to create all those interfaces. Yeah? make the grain size smaller and smaller, I'm storing more and more defect energy inside the material. And somewhere I will have to provide that free energy. Okay, so that's the amount of energy that I have to provide to the material. At the same time, we are destroying some of the parent grain boundaries. If I start with austenite and I go to ferrite, of course I have gained because I have destroyed some of the parent austenite free energy. And just by rearranging this equation and writing the amount of surface per unit volume related to 1 upon the grain size here, I need that much driving force to produce a ferrite grain size of that. Okay, so now I have a fundamental equation which says that I need that much free energy change to produce a grain size of this. Okay, so it should be possible to calculate the size of the grain that I can produce in principle. The smallest size of grains that I can produce in principle by phase transformation. And here is the curve showing the smallest grain size that I can produce as I get phase transformation at lower and lower temperatures, the driving force increases. So at low temperatures, in principle, I can produce a grain size of 10 nanometers. And this temperature, where I get a free energy change of 700 joules per mole, is of the order of 500 degrees centigrade. So, in principle, I should be able to produce very fine grain size in hundreds of millions of tons of steel by transforming at a low temperature. By forcing the transformation to happen at a low temperature. Let's see what happens in real life. So this is a theoretical calculation. What happens in real life is that nobody has managed to go below about one micrometer grain size in a production plant. Okay? So these are all experimental data from a large number of publications. So people are trying to force the transformation to happen at a lower and lower temperature. But nobody has succeeded in going below about one micrometer, even though theory says we can go down much lower than what we get experimentally. So what is the problem? The problem is that when we get a phase change, we also get a latent heat of transformation. That means heat is released. Yeah. Now, if you force the transformation to happen at a lower temperature, then that heat will actually increase the temperature of the steel. So you are not really allowing the transformation to happen at a low temperature. It's actually happening at a high temperature because it heats itself up. 
you have to have a mechanism of removing that heat in order to get a finer grain size. And there is no practical mechanism that I can think of in a steel plant to remove that heat. So, the real curve, after you allow for that heating up, is much higher than the theoretical curve if you didn't have the latent heat of transformation interfering with the process of producing a small grain size. So my prediction is that in the normal rolling processes, where we try to produce a ferrite and perlite microstructure, really we are not going to get below about one micrometer in grain size because of the heat of transformation interfering with the fact that we want to produce transformation at a lower temperature. Now, is there any way in which we can stop this heat from being emitted? Well, what we need to do is we need to store that heat inside our material in the form of some kind of a defect. If we use displacive transformation instead of reconstructive transformation, then we can store that as strain energy inside our material. So the next thing that I'm going to show you is displacive transformations at a very low temperature, producing nanometer size crystals inside very large lumps of material at a very low cost. Okay, so finally I have some good news for you. Okay? Yep. Oh, you want to, okay, time for a break, Chairman says. Okay. <laughs> Ten minutes break.